I want to direct the sermonette today to all the younger people, as if you'd be surprised by that. <laughs> but of course, the rest of you can listen in. So I see you all in the back row there in the back, and uh, I, I, I hope to uh, give you a sermonette that, that will be beneficial to you. I want to help each of you to be rooted and grounded and based in life. You know, that's a wonderful theme, because growing up, you want to have the best values you can have. The question is, what values will you have? Those are God's values to have. Those are the rock upon which you can have a solid relationship with God, the most valuable relationship that anyone can have besides having a good relationship with your parents and your family. When you make God's value and character your value and character, you can be confident and prosperous in the, all the ways that count in reality for eternity and you will be able to clearly see the lies and the false values of this world. You will be able to spot the frauds of this world a mile off. And the most important fraud for you to be able to spot is the fraud from the father of frauds, the father of lies, the being that Jesus told us was a murderer and a liar from the very beginning. Now, I recently listened to a wonderful interview, actually, as I'm, I, was, I was on my Stairmaster watching this video, of uh, Dr. Bill Phillips, who made one, many, a uh, university professor, made many wonderful contributions to the advancement of important aspects of science. He was awarded a Nobel Prize uh, for one of his contributions. He spoke about measurements, measurements. Now, he's an expert in a branch of science called metrology. It's not a word you hear very often. It's, it, it has to do with the science of measuring things. This may seem to be rather obscure, but consider if you were building a highway bridge across a big river, and you know they're building a bridge, they're building, going to rebuild the bridge on, over the Missouri River at, uh, at Roachport, just, just uh, 30 or 40 miles from here. And you absolutely have to know that every piece will fit when they arrive at the job site because all these things have to be manufactured elsewhere. And when they arrive on the site, that they all fit together. And you have to know that, that months or maybe a year ago when the engineers started to work on the bridge supports, the piers, the giant concrete structures that the bridge will sit on, that where they are exactly in the right place, exactly the right dimensions. So when they haul that giant girder off the truck and lower it in place, it fits exactly within about a tenth of an inch. It fits exactly. And you may have even seen some videos of some of these immense bridges being built that were made by building from, the, from the, each far end and building towards the middle. It's really kind of spectacular and awesome to see these uh, pieces, put the final piece in place and having it, people walk up with these sledgehammers and wedges and force this thing to fit into place. And it all depends on having accurate measurements. They all go back to one standard. But what happens if each engineer had his own tape measure and had slightly different lengths? And, and the, the crew building something uh, based on that measure would think that they were doing okay. That is, until the moment that they had to connect their part with some other part built by somebody else. And anyone who has read very much of the Bible will know that long ago, one of the units of length was called the cubit. God even used the cubit to dictate an item to Noah about the ark. We used a lot of dimensions that God gave to Moses were in cubits. Dr. Phillips tells the story of the cubit in Egypt. When they started to build their massive pyramids, they made sure that everyone was using the same measure. The cubit was based at that time on the length of Pharaoh's arm. A granite rod of the exact length was made, and then wooden rods were cut to the exact length as best as possible of the granite master rod, and these were used in measuring at the construction site. It was decreed that once a month the workers must compare their wood cubit against the granite master rod. Failure to perform this comparison was punishable by death. There's kind of a spiritual analogy there. Dr. Phillips later showed a photograph of a beautiful set of standard weights from ancient Babylon. He also showed the photo of a very old building in Germany where the town officials had embedded their standard length, the town's standard length, in the stone wall next to the sidewalk 
so the public had access to it for local use. He pointed out that each town had its own standard. Then he had a photo of himself holding the very first kilogram made out of platinum, a cube of platinum, that was made in 1799 and is stored in Paris. And that, for many years, was the standard weight for the world. And as I said before, you can imagine the problems that will happen when people in one area have a different standard of measure than other people do. And having the same uniform standard for time, distance, and weight is essential to life. The system today that we use is that we have the, ma the, the uh, meter, kilogram, and second system called the MKS system. God demands that we have honest weights and measures, and they all go back to this one standard, this standard actually that's today stored in Paris, in a vacuum under three bell jars. Uh, he had a picture of that too. After thousands of years of having different standards, the world settled on this one system, the metric system, and everything else is derived from there. The cubic re we read about in the Bible, the cubit of Pharaoh, was very imprecise. At the very least, different kings would have different lengths arms, of course. And, you know, and this is not so bad when you're making small things, but when you're making an interstate highway or you're making a bridge across a giant body of water, you can't have an error that's one part in a thousand. You can't hardly have an error that's one part in a million. Things have to be very precise. Scientists know the best standards are the ones based on the physics of this world, the physical constants that the Creator God set in place at the creation. Now, if you have a, how many people have a, a watch that's not a, have battery powered? Well, hardly anyone has a watch that goes tick tock anymore. Each of those watches that you have, or your smartphone, have a little piece of quartz in it, a little crystal that's cut in and polished in a certain exact way to vibrate at a certain exact frequency. And this is the way that all these watches keep time, is how this crystal of quartz vibrates. And it's also how your smartphone will work when you take it out of the box and plug it in for the first time. For the very first time, its crystal is, it puts it on the right frequency, just like all the other smartphones are in the right frequency. All atoms of quartz behave the same way from one end of the universe to the other. And so you may have actually even heard of an atomic clock, which works because of the exact duration of the vibration of the atoms of cesium. So no matter where you are on Earth, and actually, no matter where you are in all of this creation, all this massive universe, a quartz crystal and a cesium crystal vibrates in the same exact predictable known way. Now, at this point, I was always tempted to work towards a, a spiritual analysis about economics, but, but that's not for me. Today, I, my profit, I have to be profitable to you all, to the youth here. That's the sermonettes for, is the youth. And this sermonette is for you. The Word of God is full of His standard measurements. That's one of the punchlines here. Psalm 89 says, Righteousness and judgment are the foundation of your throne, the very foundation of God's throne. Loyal love and faithfulness come before your face. Now in Deuteronomy 7, it says, So know that Yahweh your God, He is God, the trustworthy God, maintaining His covenant and His loyal love for those who love Him with those who keep His commandments to a thousand generations. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus instructs us that when we pray to ask God to protect us from the evil one, from Satan, and sort of by implication from the demons and from those on earth who are the sons of Satan. A good sermonette will always lead a people to look up a passage for themselves, hint, hint. So I'd like you to turn to John chapter 8, where Jesus is interacting with some Pharisees. And I think this is a stunningly, this is, for me, this is such a, one of the most stunning passages in all the gospel, because I hate to think the chills that would run down your spine if this had been said to you. But in John 8, verse 44, Jesus says directly, to the Pharisees, directly to their face. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. The one was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand firm in the truth because the truth is not in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar 
and a father of lies. And thus Satan's lies permeate society because Satan is the god of this world. And this forms part of the spiritual atmosphere of this world, sort of pervasive, like a radio signal. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul called it the spirit of the world. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, in order that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Now there are several places in Scripture where some of the attributes of the world are listed. Now there's many of these, they call them sin lists. Uh, one of the ones that comes to mind easily is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which uh, says in verse 10, By no means do I mean to be sexually immoral people of this world, or the greedy people, or the swindlers, or idolaters. Since then you would have to depart out of the world. Well, that, you know, there's other sin lists that go on further. I looked up sin lists on the internet, and there was one that was a whole page long, just different things, and you can, of course, look these lists up too, but that's not my point today. I want to take a different approach with you. I want to be as helpful as possible to be firmly rooted to, so that you kids will know who you are, you will know what you believe, and you will know why you believe it. And part of that is seeing when people are trying to fool you. Now the Church of God has taught for decades, for generations, that part of Satan's deception of, of humanity lies in his ability to create counterfeit values to God's values and to use those values to replace God's values. He makes the false alternative to God's way of life and he makes it so appealing that people choose them over what God wants us to do. And then of course people start thinking that that's what they should, how they should live their lives. Satan makes love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and faith seem boring and dull and these values are unscientific and may now even be hateful. Worse, they give us privilege. See how that works? Listen to this list of godly values and consider how society submerges and replaces each. We replace wisdom with cleverness, dignity with glamour. We replace truth with political correctness. You may know the truth, but you dare not say it. We replace beauty with flash and flaunt and glitz, goodness with niceness and, and pleasantness. We replace character with personality, reputation with fame. Uh, we, re we replace respect with fear and intimidation, faithfulness with infidelity, and focus. We replace focus with misdirection. Now each of these is subtle in its own way, but let me talk about misdirection because there's a, there's a whole lot of misdirection going on here. And here's a good example. Just yesterday, I saw this article. The Washington Post carries an article this, about the reading proficiency uh, in the D.C. public schools for uh, white students during the pandemic. It dropped from 73% to 70%. For black students, it dropped from 44% to 28%. Now, the first sentence of this article was, quote, the literacy proficiency gap between white students and students of color in the district continued to widen during the second year of the pandemic. Well, so instead of having the focus on the most important issue in public education, which was it was horribly failing to teach anybody literacy, the author misdirects you by taking, making the problem this, to be systemic racism. So you see how your attention is directed away misdirected away from the real causes and towards a cause that advances the popular narrative. So it's hard to address a personal or a social problem when forces distract you from seeing a problem clearly. And as you grow up, you will find that a lot of people do not really want you to see personal and social problems clearly. They want to explain it all to you in a way that is advantageous to them. So when you are misdirected, you lack focus. You cannot prepare a good or a godly response. You expend time and resources on the wrong thing. You may even be swept along with a crowd and swept into saying yes when you should say no, or worse, putting yourself in physical or spiritual danger. Calling upon God for his wisdom, his values, his clarity, gives you priceless help to navigate the problems of life 
and the problems you are for, that are forced upon you in an effort to control you and to get you to act or believe in a certain way. And as you, so I was uh, finishing up the sermonette last night, and I, as customary, I read, I read it to my wife, and we had a discussion about the things I fix. So I'm brushing my teeth, and in the darkness of the bedroom, my wife says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Because my wife has memorized the book of James, and that's James 1, 17, from the New American Standard Bible. My wife is an NASB person. In the whole Bible study of, this, uh, of all this research, of the character attributes, you know, you can find all kinds of attributes that are directly stated and attributes that are implied. And just as all the very various physical measurements are carefully derived from the just a few precise standards of time, distance, and weight from the meter, the kilogram, and the second, so too all the spiritual attributes derived from God's one standard, one measure, His law, His mercy, His love. And these are essential to being able to have strong spiritual roots, so you can each be well-rooted, well-grounded, and based as you grow up, so you know who you are, you know what you believe, and why you believe it, so you can successfully face life, whatever comes your way.